Hello there, this is uh, Psychology A-Level and this is the stress topic and in this video we're going to be looking at the role of stress in illness um, and particularly looking at immunosuppression where the immune system or the Im immune response is suppressed or dampened down by um, the experience of stress. So we're looking in particular at how that works in the body today. Um, and in your booklets that you've got, I didn't feel this bit was particularly clear. So I'm gonna go into a bit more detail, but bear in mind, this really is background to what we're talking about. Uh, I'm just going to explain some of the different terms and vocab that you encounter in your booklet so that hopefully it's a little bit clearer. So this is, the, uh, this is white blood cells in this diagram. Um, and where you see referred to in your booklet these two terms leukocytes and lymphocytes that's what they're referring to um, at the top you can see you've got a stem cell and leukocytes and lymphocytes are both different types of white blood cell it just refers to uh, what kind of cell they come from basically and you don't need to know any more detail than that um, so the three, basically the three types of cell that we're going to be looking at are these three. We're going to be looking at macrophages, uh, natural killer cells, and then B and T cells. And hopefully this should make clearer what, um, what they're all about. I think a helpful way to split these kinds of cells is that some have uh, like a, what I like to call a generic response to, um, to foreign cells, uh, and some have a specific response. So the, those who are, the cells that are generic will target anything that's foreign, whereas a specific response is where you have an immune reaction that's specifically directed at a certain um, antigen. I'll talk in a minute if you're not sure what an antigen is, I'll give you a reminder. So first of all, um, macrophage, um, this is a, a cell that basically moves around and engulfs anything that's foreign. That's part of our generic response. It's not tailored uh, to a particular, um, a particular bacteria or a particular virus. Um, another part of our generic response is this natural killer cell, not to be confused with killer T cell, which is something different, um, which could be confusing easily. Uh, but the natural killer cell is part of the generic response. It's not tailored in particular to uh, a certain T, uh, a certain virus. It just moves around, and anything that's foreign, uh, it. Basically, there's a really good video that I'll also link to that shows this process, but it kills cells by firing toxins at them that disrupt their cell membrane and then they die uh, because their cell membrane is letting everything in and out and they can't survive that. So that's macro. That's what's part of our generic um, response to anything foreign that's entered our bloodstream, natural killer cells and macrophages. Um, and let's have a look at B and T cells. Oh yeah, I like to think of the natural killer cells being a bit like an immune system. Watch the the animation that I'll send. It's quite a, you can see it happening quite nicely. Right. Uh, next, let's look at B and T cells. So the difference between these are that B cells are made in the bone marrow, whereas T cells come from the thymus gland. So the the, the letter refers to where they've been made, um, and you can see there a picture of the thymus gland, and that's important important because that's going to be affected by the stress response so that that's not just complete background information you do need to know that um, and B and T cells are both part of our specific response against um, against viruses and bacteria and so on so when we look at um, and we might need a, a quick reminder here about antigens and antibodies it's coming on the next slide so bear with me so our B cells, what happens here is you have, um, they have receptors on their surface. When they bind to a particular antigen, uh, which might signal, for example, that the flu virus has got into the bloodstream, they, if it, so the, the flu virus then attaches to their receptors here. You can see they're specifically tailored to that, to these um, receptors. What then happens is there's um, the B cells will then become a plasma cell cell and that means they'll then be able to release lots of antibodies for the flu um, virus for example into the bloodstream and they will help to that's part of our specific response to one virus 
Okay, so let's just have a quick reminder about this. Hopefully you know already, but a quick reminder. The antibodies are these uh, triangles on the surface of this cell. They're markers on the outside of a cell that signal um, a, a, something about the cell. You don't need to know any more detail than that. Um, but uh, like, for example, a virus can um, insert its DNA into a, a human cell and then the human cell will sprout the antigens uh, for that virus in basic terms. Um, and then the antibodies uh, are these Y-shaped particles which float around in the bloodstream and they can do lots of different things. There's um, different functions here that I've listed. Some of them simply change the chemical composition of the cell which kills it. Uh, sometimes it stops um, foreign cells being able to get into body cells. Sometimes it helps them to clump together um, so that they can then be engulfed by macrophages. So that's just a quick reminder. Um, and then let's have a quick look at T cells. So killer T cells uh, will, uh, again, identify specific antigens. They'll bind to the cell and then blast it with toxins. Um, and they're sometimes also, for that reason, called cytotoxic T cells because they kill the cytoplasm in, in cells with toxins, so cytotoxic. And um, again, I've given you a, a cool animation to watch for this so you can see it happening. Um, the second type of T cell that we need to know about is a helper T cell, which we've already seen when we talked about B cells a minute ago. They help um, basically produce production of B and T lymphocytes and they help antibodies to be produced uh, as part of that. And then the last type, memory T cells. These are the ones that store the information, they remember the antigens, which means the next time you get that same virus encountered, they can respond quickly and kill it straight away, which is, as you know, probably know how vaccines work. Okay, so that is our background then to the immune system and hopefully that makes things a little bit clearer. How does this relate to stress then? That's obviously our key question since stress is our topic. So the way this works is that you have... Um, basically, the physiological change when you have your stress response, when fight or flight kicks in, uh, first of all, it takes, as you know, it, it removes any non-essential functions in the body. So things like digestion are stopped. That also applies to the immune system, because actually, if you're um, going to like fight, if you're fighting a tiger, for example, if we're thinking about silly examples of the fight or flight response, um, you you do need an immune system, but it's more important to win against the tiger now, like you might catch a cold in a few days, but that's okay. So if they dampen down the immune system um, when fight or flight happens. So yeah, it's not functioning effectively. The first thing to note is that cortisol, which as you know is an important uh, hormone released as part of the stress response. Um, it reduces the body's immune response straight away. So it makes more likely that someone will become ill. Um, but in the longer term, um, when you have constant high levels of cortisol or corticosteroids, that actually shrinks the thymus gland. So then you can't have T cells growing as much. And if you remember what we've just talked about, that T cell response is really, really important in terms of our immune response. Um, really important because it's going to have that specific response that's fast and that's uh, the memories kept of it. Uh, and it's also helping that B cell response, the helper cells also affect the B lymphocytes. So that is basically how stress then affects our immune system. Um, and let's have a look at some studies then about this. So the first study, this is a really um, a major study that was carried out in 1984. This is Janice Keekolt Glazer. Um, and this is a really well-known influential study. Um, and yeah, there's a picture of her, female psychologist for a change. Uh, so, and this was a study of uh, medical students. Um, and it's a natural experiment. I'm just going to bring in a few research methods terms here just to remind you and keep them going over. It's a natural experiment because it's taking advantage of something that's naturally happening, which is medical students have to sit exams so that's an event that's happening that's not being set up by the experiment so the IV in this experiment they looked at a low stress time for the medical students and they looked at a high stress time and what they did was they took a blood sample 
at a low stress time which was about a month before their exams when they were reasonably relaxed uh, before their final exams Um, and they also took a blood sample on the first day of their final exams Uh, and after after the students had taken two of their exams as well so particularly sorry not as well you've got two samples one is a month before and once Uh, again on the first day of their final exams. So that's a repeated measures design. If you're thinking about your research methods, you're looking at the same students and you're comparing them to themselves one month before and then on the first day of their final exams. And those are called low stress and high stress samples. They also used questionnaires to assess various other things like loneliness and life events. And what they found was that the high stress sample had less natural killer cell activity if you remember your natural killer cells are those generic cells that travel around uh, and they just target anything that's foreign they're really important in our immune response so that high stress sample on the first day of their exams it was showing there was less activity of those really important cells so that supports the idea of stress negatively affecting our immune response then they also found various things linked with the questionnaire. So if someone was had a high rating for like loneliness, depression or anxiety, they that was then linked with a weakened immune response uh, more than those who were reporting less of those things. They tended to have stronger immune responses. Um, so, yeah, that's the conclusion that stress was associate, associated with a lowered immune response. So that's kind of your key study for this topic really it's really well known and really influential okay let's look at some other bits of research that are that support this um so keycolt glazer also did another study uh, where they they actually gave small wounds to participants and then measured how long they took to heal um, and what they found was that in women who had um, who were looking after um, like elderly relatives, uh, for example, people with dementia or elderly relatives with health issues, um, the healing process took longer. And they concluded that that was because of the stress involved in looking after elderly relatives and the stress was weakening their immune system. Um, so again that's supporting the idea of stress uh, weakening the immune system and then we've got Cohen uh, which where they were giving participants the cold virus I'm sure hopefully there are flags going up in many of your brains for this as I'm talking about this about ethics so Cohen injected participants with a cold virus um, and participants who had high stress scores were more likely to catch a cold. Uh, so again, it's that link between if you're highly stressed, then your immune response is less good. Um, there's some more research here. This is not in your booklet, um, but it's a really good study. So um, here it is. You might want to make some notes, some quite detailed notes on this one. So this is Riley. Um, and there were... they. Put, they put mice on a turntable um, ro- constantly rotating and that was meant to uh, induce stress and actually it only took five hours for this to lead to a lowered lymphocyte count so when they're taking a blood sample they're looking at how many uh, white blood cells are circulating in the bloodstream so it's showing straight away that it's affecting the number of white blood cells circulating Uh, And then part two of the experiment, mice were then injected uh, with cancer cells and some of these, uh, some of the mice that had been injected were rotated for 10 minutes every hour, which was the high stress condition. And then there was a control group who were also injected with cancer cells, but they were not rotated for 10 minutes every hour. And after three days, they found much more tumour growth in the stressed mice compared to the controls. So again, it's showing there's not as much of an immune response against these tumorous cancer cells. In those mice who are not being rotated, who are not experiencing stress, they're more able to fight the growth of those cancer cells and to kill some of those cancer cells off with their immune response. Those who are being stressed by rotation are not able as much to fight that tumor growth. 
So it's it's a good. The reason I've left it in is that it's a really good study because it's showing really clear cause and effect in a controlled lab setting, um, in a way that is quite hard to show with humans. Even in the Keyholt Glazer studies, you've got many other factors, haven't you, affecting? It's not they're not lab experiments in the same way. You've got many other factors affecting those people that took part. You know, we can't really be sure that. It was the stress that was causing it, causing the lowered immune response, uh, really definitively sure. So that's the good thing about this research. Obviously, you have got the issue that it's animals uh, and that, again, we've got issues because humans are more complex. They experience stress in different ways. And we've talked about all of that before. Uh, right, let's look at contradicting evidence then. Um, there's this Evans study that we've got where they actually made people do like a stressful thing, like a big public speaking event and um, measured their um, antibodies in their bloodstream and found that actually that led to having more antibodies in their bloodstream. Um, so that directly contradicts it really when you've got an immediate, it's suggesting that when you've got an immediate stressor that actually that the, the first reaction, at least, is to enhance the immune system, not to dampen it down. So, yeah, short-term stress can actually help. That suggests that. So that's contradicting evidence to the idea that um, stress will weaken the immune system. Uh, and then the last point to make, really, this, again, is kind of like a strength and a bit of further discussion first of all like the findings of these of research in this area has been really helpful because it means first of all that we can anticipate problems like when somebody is under a constant stress we can anticipate that perhaps they need to be looking after their health in in as many ways as possible they need to anticipate that their immune response may be lower and that you can also develop stress management techniques some of which we'll look at later in this topic uh, if we link that then also to the economy um, if you think about it this area of research does have effects on the economy uh, that we have to be aware of so uh, when you are stressed if you have a low immune system and that leads to illness that's likely to be of greater cost to the nhs if you think about riley's mice for example you're more likely to to have tumor growth for cancer that could be quite costly to the nhs so it's um, got important implications for the economy and that means that we can take steps as well we can train people for how to manage stress we can uh, help them to learn strategies and that could re also reduce the cost to the nhs if we're to invest in things like that as like a preventative measure as well as obviously reducing uh, illness and stuff in people which is good not just thinking about money here um, and then we also you could also think about putting uh, research uh, money into research which compares how effective different stress strategies are. So sorry, that was quite a long video, but hopefully helpful. <laughs>